Sunday, July 27th, 2014, and the reporters are ready to roll. First up, body slam. Rob Olson waiting on the Ventura verdict. Raw and uncut, why police want the media to turn over all its footage in a high-profile missing persons case. Essentially, we've eliminated a free press. The platinum parachute, the father of NPR still getting a big paycheck in retirement. This isn't a Fortune 500 company. Untouchable, why aren't Minnesota politicians going ballistic over Medtronic's epic tax dodge? It's politically embarrassing. All that plus The Breakfast Club with Steve Marsh, Lucy Quinlivan, and Robin Robinson back in the house. The reporters are ready to roll. Hey everyone, thanks for making The Reporters part of your Sunday morning, we appreciate it. And we are serving up a buffet of news today, a little sports, some politics, some inside media ball as well. But first, after three days and more than 25 hours of deliberations, the jury in the Jesse Ventura defamation case has yet to reach a verdict. Ventura claims the late Chris Kyle made up the story of a bar fight in his book, American Sniper, and lied about Ventura saying, quote, the SEALs deserve to lose a few. The two-week trial offering lots of conflicting witness testimony. Rob Olson is joining us from the federal courthouse in St. Paul. Rob, conventional wisdom has been the longer the jury's out, the more this helps Ventura. Why is that? Well, you would think a uh, quick verdict. If you, you, know, you heard the, the jury was back right away, it's uh, because they decided there was not defamation. And if they say no to defamation, which is his first claim, then they're done. They don't have to consider anything else and we would all go home. But we've been here now all week since uh, they got this uh, uh, on Tuesday afternoon. The thought is that means that somebody is convinced by uh, Jesse Ventura's claim and therefore there is a healthy debate going on. There could be a stalemate or a deadlock or it means they've gotten past that defamation question are in fact debating damages or maybe they moved on to other parts of Jesse Ventura's lawsuit. So the fact that it's gone this long means that they're again either deadlocked on something or they've gone deeper into the questions that they need to answer, Tom. Yeah, and it's a complicated verdict for them. I mean, I think there are, there are three criteria and then there are sub criteria in there as well. My question, uh, Rob, when when does Judge Kyle step in at, at this point? How well, long do we have this stalemate? You know, that's that's not clear. I mean, I've talked to several people who say that, you know, their their gut feeling is they come back on Monday and if they can't get something done on Monday, if in fact they are deadlocked and we do not know that, uh, that uh, then he might say, that's enough but there's no there's no clear written instructions about uh, about that so typically what happens is again if it's a hung jury situation and we don't know they could again just be in a debate on some other thing uh, they would come to the judge and say hey we can't get past this uh, the judge would say all right I'm gonna give you more time kind of like it's a World Cup match mm -hmm. here's extra time for you I'll tell you when it's up right. uh, and it works like that typically is how that goes again it's hard to know. Nobody knows exactly what's going on in that room. And I, I know there's a 10 minute notice and then the verdict will be read. Is Jesse Ventura hanging out at the courthouse? We've not seen him. We've not seen him since Tuesday. You know, they got the verdict Tuesday afternoon. He hung out here. There's rooms up on the uh, top floor here reserved for both sides for the attorneys. And uh, he's been here uh, that day. We haven't seen him since. He's got to be nearby, though, for that 10 minute rule, uh, unless he doesn't plan on attending the verdict. Uh, Taya Kyle, Chris Kyle's widow, is here for a couple of days. We were told today now that uh, she left the state. She has been apart from their two children for several weeks now, and she wanted to see him again. They wouldn't say that she had gone home to Texas, only that she had left Minnesota. Uh, didn't know if she'd be coming back at all. Uh, appreciates the time the jury's put into it. Is that a sign that it's not going to go their way, that they have some indication? Maybe, maybe not. Again, we don't know. Tom. All right, long weekend of waiting. Then Rob Olson at the federal courthouse in St. Paul. Thanks a lot. So we had a reminder this week, the relationship between police and reporters can really be a strange one. In many ways, it is symbiotic. We need each other, but we also have very different agendas, or at least we should. Consider the case of 13-year-old Amy Sue Paniak, who vanished from a gas station 25 years ago. Ever since, her parents have been under a cloud of suspicion. But when the cold case reopened earlier this year, Police try to get reporters to do their work by proxy. They're doing something, finally. <laughs> Even with FBI agents and police digging up her backyard this spring looking for evidence, 
Susan Paniak didn't hesitate to talk to reporters. Police spending another day searching the parents' home of a Maple Grove girl. But detectives weren't satisfied with sound bites. They wanted to hear everything to see if it contradicted her earlier statements. In search warrants made public this week, Maple Grove police sought the raw footage of Susan Paniak's interviews with local television stations. In getting a judge to sign off on the search warrant, a detective wrote, the police department was contacted by multiple media outlets, suggesting the police obtain copies of the raw and unedited interviews. Something that seems hard to believe, but Maple Grove police won't comment. How unusual is it for law enforcement to go after unedited footage? It's not all that unusual. Journalism professor Jane Kirtley says there are some protections for the press. Minnesota's shield law, but it allows police to get a search warrant if there's evidence of a felony or gross misdemeanor, a very low bar. There is also a federal statute that offers more protection, but Kirtley says few in the media even know about it. Why shouldn't police be going after a news organization's unedited footage? If law enforcement can turn journalists into their investigators, then essentially we've eliminated a free press. We're no longer independent, we're now just an arm of the government. Fox 9, like most news organizations, has a policy to never give out unedited footage. And in fact, raw footage is deleted out of our system after a week. That may be why those search warrants were apparently never served on any members of the media. But nothing says police won't try again. And it also strikes me, why would anyone in the world ever talk to a reporter if they think that reporter's unedited footage could trip them up in, in a legal case? That's a, a, a really important consideration. You know, journalists are not required to tell criminal suspects basically to give them a Miranda warning. They can't say what you're saying to me could be used against you in a court of law. Again, Maple Grove police not commenting on any aspect of that case. Now onto one I think is probably one of the most underreported local stories I can think of. But in the national media, Medtronic is quickly becoming the poster child for everything wrong with taxes and politics in America. Medtronic CEO Omar Ishraq took a pass on testifying before a Senate committee this week on why Medtronic is shifting its legal address to Ireland when it buys Covidian, something known as corporate inversion. Sounds more like a meteorological term. The move allows Medtronic to tap $14 billion in overseas revenue, tax at just 12.5 half percent in Ireland rather than the 35 percent by Uncle Sam would take. To be fair, Medtronic's hardly alone on this. Eight companies have done inversions so far this year, 50 in the last decade. There was already a Senate bill on the table that would make inversions more difficult for U.S. companies. So we asked Mint Post reporter Devin Smith, who covers the Minnesota delegation in Washington, whether Congress can get its act together. If this bill, the Senate bill, gets to the Senate floor, it's probably not going to go much further than that. So it just strikes me, strikes me as really curious that the Minnesota delegation seems so quiet on this issue. You know, they sort of wring their hands and they're like, it, it's not good, it's bad, but they're not screaming from the rooftops. Is that just because Medtronic is such a powerful Minnesota institution? Well, that's part of it, and, and you definitely see, especially Republicans, point to this and say Medtronic is, is, yes, it's a huge Minnesota company, and now we are beginning to feel at home the effects of the, the federal tax policy that, we, that we're trying to change here in Washington. Both Senators Amy Klobuchar and Al Franken signed on to the Senate bill back in May. That was before Medtronic made their deal. Uh, so they've supported this policy shift all along. I talked to Representative Eric Paulson this week, who sits on the tax writing committee in the House, and he basically said, look, this is, this is uh, an example of why we need comprehensive tax reform. But you're right, it's very difficult for anybody to come out and be too angry uh, at, a, at a Minnesota company, uh, especially you know, when that company is keeping corporate uh, headquarters in, in uh, Minnesota for on operational purposes. Comprehensive tax reform in which uh, corporate inversions would be included, that doesn't sound very likely given what's happening in Washington right now. Am I right on that? No, it doesn't. I mean, we're simply running out of time and there is no political ability, there's no political will to compromise on something as big as comprehensive tax reform between now and the end of the year. Uh, that's, that's just the long and the short of it. That's basically where we're at. Gosh, doesn't all that sound familiar? So everyone always wonders, how much is the boss making, right? And for years, there's been a, really an obsession with Bill Kling's salary. He is the revered former top executive at Minnesota Public Radio, who stepped down three years ago. 
But a former government official turned blogger discovered even in retirement, Kling's getting one heck of a golden parachute. In so many ways, Bill Kling is really the father of public radio. From a small station in Collegeville in 1967, he built Minnesota Public Radio and its parent company, American Public Media. Kling retired three years ago, but he didn't stop getting paid. Hey, they're still paying their former CEO, and hey, he's got a company that they're also paying, and these numbers are adding up to pretty big dollars. Former Deputy Commerce Commissioner turned blogger Bill Glahn made that interesting discovery going through NPR's nonprofit tax returns. In the 2013 fiscal year, Kling got direct compensation of $370,000. And Kling's consulting company got another $716,000 for a grand total of more than a million bucks. His retirement compensation the year before was $780,000. There's still another 12 months that we don't know about. Exactly. Kling is actually making more money in retirement than he did when he was CEO. And by sheer coincidence, it's roughly what NPR gets every year in public financing, roughly 8% of its $85 million budget. Kling's front-loaded deferred compensation isn't unusual in the corporate world, but Glahn wonders about the message it sends for a nonprofit. This isn't a Fortune 500 company. This is, in every respect, a public entity. It's public radio. A spokesperson for NPR points out that all Kling's retirement compensation ended last year, although final figures won't be available until next year. And his deal was approved by NPR's board looking at comparable nonprofits. A final point, no legacy or taxpayer funds are apparently used for executive salaries. Last week, we told you about the projected economic impact from baseball's All-Star Game. This week, we run the numbers to get a sense of what it cost us, the bill sort of coming due. The city of Minneapolis releasing its contract with Major League Baseball, first revealed by the Star Tribune this week. In the contract, the city agreed to give Major League Baseball the convention center rent-free for FanFest for an estimated $258,000. No rent for the convention center. In addition, the U.S. Uh, the city credited $150,000 for services associated with the event. That includes projectors, security, janitorial services, and even food, things like that. Add to all that $119,000 in overtime the city is expected to shell out, and we are looking at more than a half million dollars in expenses right off the bat. And keep in mind, this number does not include the cost of extra law enforcement. Those figures should be coming soon. A growing tab, to be sure. Many say, hey, this is just the price you pay to get marquee events to come into town. Well, after the break, training camp starts for the Vikings, but no one's talking about what's really happening on the field, at least not right now, because, of course, the Chris Cluey saga continues, and Coach Mike Prefer coming clean, sort of. Plus, the Breakfast Club is here, one of them back in her old stomping grounds. We are talking Cluey, Dungey, and Bachman. The Reporters is coming right back. The biggest thing I regret is that um, I brought a lot of uh, bad publicity to the Minnesota Vikings and I uh, felt like I let my, <clears throat> my family down. Special teams coordinator Mike Prefer coming clean finally on comments he made to former punter Chris Cluey. He's got a three game suspension, needs to go through sensitivity training. According to the Vikings internal investigation, a summary just released, Prefer lied in January about, quote, saying putting all the gays on an island and nuking it. And joining us here at The Breakfast Club, Lucy Quinlivan, who does a podcast with Ron Rosenbaum holding court. Robin Robinson, arts ambassador at the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport, and of course, a former Fox 9 anchor back in the house with us today, and Steve Marsh from Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. Guys, I know that the sports reporters who cover this really want this story to get away, go away. They want to get back to football. Does this go away now? Was that enough, that apology? I don't think so. I think there will be eyes on the organization for what they do in the future. Uh, it's uh, Everybody hates to be in the spotlight. Any organization wants a bad story about itself to go away. But he really didn't handle that very well, saying that his biggest regret is bringing 
uh, bad publicity to the Vikings, he should say the thing he regrets right. most is saying it. Yeah. And we don't know about other things he might have said. What, what do you think? Oh, pray for lie before, and I really think that this apology is a stretch. It seems to me that he's a valued member of the Vikings organization. They want this thing to be done with. They say, get out there and make an apology and, and make it sound like you're sincere. But it, it, we know that the culture in any sports organization is one that is vastly vastly in, ingrained in some things that are not so pleasant for us to discuss anymore, not so PC. Right, right. But I think that this was just a quick opportunity for them to get ahead of this lawsuit, say, you know, we just want this rectified, go out and make an apology. Well, I mean, that's the thing, like if you let, like if you mic the inside of an NFL locker room, the things that were said would make the news every night. Exactly. You the know? Other thing and we keep watching, so. I, I think there's a hypocrisy uh, on the Vikings' behalf, but there's also hypocrisy on every sports fan's behalf. I mean, just look what happened with Ray Rice and the videotape of him dragging out, and, and that stuff will be forgotten by week four, you know? And I think it's, there's an interesting segue here to Tony Dungy's comments, the legendary NFL coach, mm -hmm. about Michael Sam this week. I want to show you this comment. Dungy is saying uh, about Michael Sam that he should have a chance to play, but I wouldn't want to deal with it. Uh, he said, not because I don't believe Michael Sam shouldn't have a chance to play, but I wouldn't want to have to deal with it. It's not going to be a sm totally smooth thing to happen. Now, Dungy has some religious views that he's talked about before, but I, this seems to be the old yarn that you could have said about Jackie Robinson. We'd love to have Jackie Robinson exactly. in the clubhouse, Tony Dungy, except exactly. it's Tony just going to be... Tony was a black quarterback in the University of Minnesota. And you know what's disappointing about Tony Dungy? I mean, anybody has their, their beliefs, and we've all known that he's a very Christian man. But what's disappointing is that he reached out to Michael Vick and gave Michael Vick a helping hand when he was involved in all the dog scandals. Right. And he's not willing to reach out. And, and what he says in, in his practices, in his family practices group, is that they reach out to all young men that have had a hard time that need guidance and coaching. Where is he for Sam? This also brings up that uh, it seems, you know, Michael Sam is mentioned as a kind of a marginal player. He was a great college player, but nobody was sure he was going to be a great pro. So are we setting up that, you know, the first yeah. out gay guy is going to have to be so terrific that... Yeah. You know, he surpasses all others. Because the fact is, he isn't a Jackie Robinson in, in mm -hmm. terms of talent. He's not, and that's just the reality of this situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it strikes me also about, uh, especially with Dungy, about the PC police. I guess one of the things I wonder and worry about, are we at a point with gay rights that people can't be critical and say, hey, my religious views, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that there should be gay marriage. Are we at a point where the PC police are coming along that you can't say that? And I think we're still America. People have the legitimate right to believe, to not believe in that, in, in, in gay marriage. Everybody has or what, a what right have you? To, to have their beliefs. But in this situation where all eyes are on football for the culture of football and what mm -hmm. it has been, and now this is a 21st century sport, you are seeing a lot of different rules, regulations, people, uh, objectives that are, are part of the game. For him to not move forward even though he has his, his beliefs, what does that say about the sports in, in general? How is it going to change in the future? Are we going to allow old stereotypes and old ideas just to influence the game from here on out? I mean, he, he, here's somebody who can forgive uh, murderers and dog killers and, and, and finds compassion in his heart for them. Uh, why, why does he think that that would be too big of a distraction for his team to have a gay guy on the team? Right. And that he can believe what exactly. he wants to believe, but the fact that he's in a position to hire people, he has to apply yeah. a different yeah. standard than his own right. feelings. Let's leave gays and athletics behind yeah. for just a moment and talk about politics. Michelle Bachman sort of tiptoeing into the 2016 presidential race, saying that she should at least be considered in there. Later, by the way, she backtracked as well. Uh, but she certainly wants her name to be, to be in there, and she is a prolific fundraiser. Has her time come and gone, or, yeah, or does she still have mileage? She's That's unelectable. Yeah. I mean, whose money is she going to waste? This doesn't sound like it's going to be her own. If she's un un unelectable, why isn't Rick Perry unelectable? Because I think they had the same kind of disastrous campaign. I think new glasses is, is not going to help Rick Perry unelectable. any. I mean, a new pair of glasses is not going to change the man it and his new shoes. Sorry. It doesn't hurt Michelle Bachman at all to say that she's considering this, because she's getting attention. Everyone's talking about her again, and she'd been out of the spotlight for a while. But if she ever officially runs, it'll be another short one, because 2012 was very disappointing for mm -hmm. her. She won that Ames straw poll. 
the caucus just five short months yeah. later was extremely poor showing. She, she did, and you know, it's so easy uh, in Minnesota, people love to dog uh, Michelle Bachman, but I gotta tell you, I saw her, uh, her announcement in Waterloo, and it was actually the day before the uh, Waterloo, she did it in kind of a, a small uh, little place where her parents used to dance, a ballroom, and she was electric. She was like no other politician I'd ever seen. And she got out there and she gave an impromptu 20 minute speech, the likes of I've, I've never seen in my whole life. And, and I think people underestimate her. And the one thing about her is I think she's a true believer. I think <laughs> she's got great charisma. I th obviously there's a, a, a number of people who believe what she says and she believes what <laughs> she says. But I think, you know, her time has come and gone in the political realm in Washington. I think she could take that money and be very much like a Sarah Palin and create her own network and her own, you know, uh, her own uh, blog cast, her own uh, media personality. Media personality. Stuff. She's, she's personality. Yeah, she yeah. wants yeah. to sell books yeah. by saying I'm in Iran. It's mm -hmm. It's a Sunday morning, and I want, I'm going to throw you a curveball. I want to know what's making you happy on this Minnesota summer. Two words. What's making you happy, Steve Marsh? Oh, my God. Um. <laughs> okay. Robin Robinson, what's making you happy? What's making me happy is that we are taking the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport into a 21st century airport that combines art and technology. Lucy? I'm energized by my new podcast. But <laughs> heat, we go. two words, heat We'll humidity. get back to Steve Marsh another time. We go on the record when Thank we come back. <laughs> <laughs> two words. It's time to go on the record about the importance of superheroes. I was about 10 when the kids in the neighborhood teased me for playing with superhero action figures. So with tears in my eyes one day, I gently placed all of them, Green Lantern, Aquaman, Batgirl, into the Bat Van, ever so carefully, and placed it at the bottom of a trash can. I have regretted doing that for about 40 years. I offer this little confession so you might appreciate the importance of what Marvel announced this week, a black Captain America. To go along with a new female Thor, by the way, now, I wish we could have just a new superhero of color, but comic books are sort of notorious for the reboot. Fact is, kids model their dreams and aspirations on adults they know and see. So every time a Somali or Hmong child sees a cop, a teacher, or a politician who looks like them, they see their future, an obtainable dream. We need superheroes, and we need them to be black, to be Asian and gay. They need to look like us. And if anyone has seen a bat van with 15 lonely action figures, look me up. That is the reporters for this July 27th, 2014. Uh, look us up, by the way, at myfox9.com backslash reporters. And we hope to see you right back here next Sunday morning.